Hello, everyone. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, Robbie Toulouse uh, for the ILO Co-op 100th interview series today. Robbie Toulouse is an Indonesian-Canadian uh, cooperator who has worked uh, across uh, Asia-Pacific region for many different uh, institutions wearing uh, different hats, but always a cooperative uh, practitioner and activist. So. We are very happy to have you with us, uh, Robbie. Uh, Thank you. Well, Simel, uh, if I may start. <laughs> Please, we would like to know how you got uh, involved in the cooperative. Uh, right. Please go Thank ahead. You. Well, before I start, I'd like to first, of course, congratulate you uh, for the uh, centennial of uh, 100 years of the cooperative unit. If I think Albert Thomas would have been alive now, he would be so elated and happy to see what great initiatives you have come forward with. Yeah, so uh, what you have done. <clears throat> well, uh, first thing first, uh, Simel, uh, regarding my background, you know, I'm, I'm of Chinese descent. I was born in Indonesia and I was living in a, uh, in a community that's very diverse, very diverse. And that being the case, there was there were Dutch people because we were under Dutch colony. There were Muslim people. There were Chinese people. They were what they call the schism of the Ambonese people. So I live in a diverse society. And that being the case, from the early years, I've always been inclined to see working together in a diverse situation. Unfortunately, we are under the Dutch colony at that time, and Sukarno was the president, as you know, and his vice president was Mohammed Hatta. So during my early years, even in the secondary school, we were already taught about Pancasila after independence and the five tenets of the Indonesian uh, philosophy or ideology. And of course, you know, the last tenet being social justice and it's always cooperation, Gotong Royong, as we call it in Indonesia. So th this whole thing uh, came into uh, my, my set of minds, so to speak, and that brings a philosophical underpinning in what you're doing in your later years. And so uh, fast forward, I became uh, very much uh, involved in setting up a credit union movement under the, the guide and mentorship of a Jesuit priest. And why did I do that? It's because at that time, Indonesia has a runaway inflation of 500%. That's during the Sukarno era. So you cannot organize any financial activity there. And the government has politicized the movement, uh, the, uh, what is it, the Coptus, because the Coptus at that time was dragged into the mainstream, uh, the political mainstream. So you'll see that in that environment, you cannot build Coptus. It comes and go, it comes and go. But then in 1969, when the economy under Suharto became a little more stable, that's the time when the Jesuit priest and I said, hey, let's start with the credit union system, because that's a good thing to start because uh, many of the rural uh, people were disadvantaged. And so that's how we started off. We set up a credit union counseling office, which is a self-help organization or promotional organization. And through that organization, organization we built cooperatives in many urban as well as rural areas, basically to uh, uh, free all the uh, poor people from the uh, crouch, uh, crouches of the uh, money lenders at the time. Mm. And also because of the consumerism that started to seep in because of the new order of the Suharto, where he brought in many uh, external, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, investment, uh, foreign investment. And so you have, a, uh, in my students here, we have a, a, a two sort of a stream of thoughts. One is doing business to become you know, rich because there's this uh, uh, segment of foreign investment on the one hand, liberalization of the economy, or helping the society. Because we see, you know, the dichotomy between rich and poor being so fast at the, at the time. And then what is interesting also, the government is not promoting financial cooperatives. They're promoting what they call the KUDs, the Phillips Unit Cooperatives. And the Phillips Unit Cooperatives was part of the, uh, of, uh, of the enhancement of the Green Revolution at that time. Actually, FAO <laughs> was involved in building that, uh, uh, that system. But of course, FAO has a good uh, uh, 
meaning at the time because uh, with the Ujama village in that Tanzania at that point where they start mm -hmm. to build you know uh, uh, good strong uh, people-based movements in rural areas uh, but it's all top-down it's not mm -hmm. <laughs> all the philosophy uh, philosophical uh, or rather the uh, the policies were all uh, generated top-down so I said no no we'll have to start something from up, from bottom up and we had lots of problems. <laughs> I was we were given an incubation of five years by the government. They said, if nothing happens with the credit unions, we will ban, ban it altogether. So from 70 to 75, we built the credit union movement. We managed to set up about 132 credit unions. And then it shows that the uh, villages, were, uh, villages were very happy being able to save, being able to uh, be frugal and, uh, you know, and build their their own village bank, so to speak. Now, but I have problems because the government said, no, there will only one system in Indonesia, which is the KUD. <laughs> so your credit union system has to be absorbed by the mm -hmm. KUD and become a unit of their savings and loan. Mm -hmm. And what I told the government, I, I told the government, fine, fine and well, but it's not up to me. It's up to those people who, mm -hmm. who owns the credit unions. So we set up annual general meetings and all the members said no we don't want to be absorbed we'd better be banned rather than be absorbed by the KUDs and so that was what happened mm -hmm. and <clears throat> and that was my connectivity with ILO as well as a matter of fact mm -hmm. if I may in 1975 I was invited by COPEC uh, to uh, Sweden uh, in South mm -hmm. we had a meeting on um, on uh, cooperative development vis-a-vis -vis agriculture cooperative development and I remember Dr. Neviger from FAO at that time was the key uh, speaker and key player at that time and he was in Indonesia also helping this uh, the government to set up this multi-purpose cooperatives so it was interesting because in Charles Sabadin I was there and I was the odd voice so to speak <laughs> in the entire system because uh, when I met uh, Klusa and Klusa of course at that time was also studying with IFCO uh, mm. and so I said to them I said look you know I'm a small guy starting doing things from the bottom up and I hear here this entire system, uh, symposium talking about top down <laughs> so mm. uh, something must be wrong. There must be a micro and micro policy uh, mm. sort of combined to make sure that development takes place, uh, you know, because uh, corps are humanizing agents for mm. you know, human development and not just for, mm. you know, mm. not just for the sake of economic development. But anyway, fast forward, I, uh, I managed to uh, set up the credit system and it reads a thousand in 1980. I said, well, you know, I've done my self-help group uh, activities and I want to sort of move on to other cooperative sectors. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then I was, uh, at that time, I was uh, hired by the Asian Confederation of Credit Unions to become the, um, <clears throat> their training advisor on uh, credit unions, primarily in Southeast Asia. In South Asia. Sri Lanka, India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. And I was very happy to do that. At the same time, I was also elected chair, the first chair of the credit union system in Indonesia because they have an annual general assembly and they elected me chair. So I was with IQ and being chair of the credit union system in Indonesia. So that was my early uh, endeavors in the cooperative system, if I may, Sima, before I moved on. So. <laughs> And then you moved on to working. I was, I, I was at IQ for two uh -huh. years, uh, based in Korea, but I had to stay half year Korea, start half year Indonesia because I was chair of the credit union as well. Right, so, right. And then spent most of the time in South Asia. That's why Sanasa is one of, uh, in South Asia, was one of my very uh, interesting uh, hub, so to speak, because <laughs> we started together with Dr. Kirimandeni, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kirimandeni at the time. But anyway, after two years, something happened is that, you know, I'm becoming more and more pressured by the government because I was the one who actually revolted against them in the past. Or I, I'm not saying I'm revolting, it's, you know, because I'm not an, uh, that kind of a, a revolu revolutionist. It's an evolutionist, right? So, but anyway, while doing so, uh, I was also with the Asian Partnership for Human Development that was based in Australia. Mm -hmm. And Asia Partnership for Human Development uh, is a social uh, justice 
committee and, uh, uh, and composed of all the justice and peace commissions of the Episcopal commissions worldwide. So it was the first time that I went in 1976 to Canada, but not because of the credit unions, but because of APHD. And mm. while in Canada, I said, I'd like to be exposed <laughs> to what co-optives are like, credit unions are like. And so I got a much more ingrained knowledge of uh, what co-optives like, uh, was like. And so when I was given the chance in 83 uh, to sort of uh, leave Indonesia because of some pressures that was really happening at the time on, my, on me, I, I, that's a long story. It's another story it's altogether. It's a personal one. Uh, but that given the fact, I, I was given a couple of opportunities, either at IQ, <laughs> either at the APHD itself in Australia, uh, and I was given the opportunity to also uh, <clears throat> work at that time with the CUNA International, or rather, well, World Council was giving me some credit units. But I said, no, no, I want to not work with credit units altogether. I'd like to learn more about cooperatives. And so, fortunately enough, I got an offer from the uh, Cooperative Union of Canada, the Cooperative mm -hmm. Development Foundation of Canada. And so that's how I started off working in Ottawa with the Cooperative Development Foundation, which is part of the Cooperative Union of Canada at that time. And so that being the case, uh, I had a two-year contract, and after two years, I kept going <laughs> because uh, not that I like, but also the kids like it. So, so that being the case, then it, it continued on. And I was with the CDF and CUC, and CUC amalgamated with the College of Canada, became CCA, and I was still there mm -hmm. up until 1993, when I was then again uh, given the opportunity to fill in a position at the uh, in International Cooperative Alliance in New Delhi as a senior policy advisor, which was, I say, oh, that's nice because I like public policy issues. And so, so I moved on to ICA in 1993 as senior policy advisor. And in the meantime, I, I also worked out of uh, Manila at that time because the CCA wanted me to continue the second phase of their bilateral programs in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And so I was uh, not half and half, but, so, uh, but basically I'm an ICA, but working for CCA in, in parts as a volunteer. Mm. And so after mm. that, um, in 1996, I, I, again, I was offered the job of, uh, or I won that uh, uh, position of uh, regional director for mm. ICA in Asia Pacific. Asia Pacific. Which, which I gladly took. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how I got so close to Taimini being the, uh, you know, the network coordinator, uh, co-op net coordinator in, uh, in New Delhi. We, we had very close relations with ILO in the field then, and that Taimini making uh, or creating so many good books, you know, the, from uh, uh, Reform to Reconstruction and uh, that very good book that he mm -hmm. uh, that he uh, that he uh, wrote before he passed away unfortunately mm -hmm. and so and then of course uh, with ILO I had so many other uh, joint activities yeah <laughs> yeah please do tell us you started uh, sharing some of the uh, stories experiences uh, from 1975 uh, but yes. uh, and co-op net if you could uh, Tell us uh, more, uh, especially yes, so the ICA, uh, the, the re uh, regional uh, director, you had uh, many involvements uh, with ILO colleagues uh, in the field, uh, working with projects, uh, policy level efforts, uh, right. if you can tell us about those. Well, I will, thank you. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, my first uh, encounter with COPEC in 19... Uh, 75 allows me to also meet, of course, with the ILO people, and uh, I forgot who they were, by the way, but of course, you know, it was way back. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but then, of course, Jürgen von Mural, of course, I had an opportunity to also overlap with him a little in the 90, early 1990s, uh, when Jürgen was still had, heading the cooperative unit. Uh, <clears throat> but why am I close to working with ILO? Perhaps you may know that in the cooperative uh, uh, ICA board of Asia Pacific at the time, Israel was still a member. Mm -hmm. And Israel was still a member. Now they are part of the Europe, European uh, mm -hmm. region. But Yehuda Pass is one of my mentors at, on the board of the ICA. And he never stopped saying that, Robbie, you have to work together with, <laughs> with 
ILO because we have so many commonalities in terms of what we need to do and, and, and promoting at that time the ILO recommendation 127, of course, mm -hmm. which was a little more restrictive compared to the 193. Mm -hmm. But it was at that time when, uh, <clears throat> when uh, ICA and uh, ILO convene a number of activities uh, regionally as well. For example, if we have a meeting in Bangkok at the UN for consultative bodies, that was also the time when we overlap with ILO a lot. And then, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, what's his name? Uh, Mark Levin came in. Mm -hmm. And Mark Levin being such a good cooperator, you know, and we, 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 we shared so many good, uh, what is it, uh, fused together. Uh, Mark uh, was very much involved in also bringing us closer to the ICFTU, actually. Mm. which is the workers' uh, trade union uh, movement in the Asia-Pacific. And that's how I got to know Mr. Suzuki very closely also. And mm. we worked together, for example, in Nepal uh, mm. during structural adjustment processes and how do we have to rebuild the cooperative system there among the informal and formal workers in, in Nepal. Uh, and then we tried very much at the time to put a shift from the labor unions or trade unions into cooperative system. But there was a leadership gap there because the leadership of the trade unions is very strong and, mm -hmm. and the uh, Nepalese one not being so strong. So it was mm -hmm. a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. but Mr. Suzuki and I continued, you know, let's do somewhere else. And so we had regional uh, activities together. And so that was during Mark Levine. And, and of course, with, with the passing of, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, the pass. No, no, of Taimini, of Taimini. Taimini, okay. Right, so see, he was replaced by Teresita de Leon. Okay. And so uh, Terry and I also were very close because he was the chair of NATCO and I was in the Philippines helping her organization fr from very small beginnings, you know, to what NATCO mm -hmm. is now. And so uh, Terry was a very good cooperator. Um, Mark Levine uh, liked her, but she doesn't write much in terms of reports. So I have to do the reporting and mechanisms and whatnot. But it was a very good collaborative mechanism that, 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 that took place there. And in fact, we went together to OECD. Uh, the first time that microfinance was introduced uh, at OECD to try and set up their policy main, uh, streamlining. And so Terry and I were the only co uh, people talking cooperatives. All the others were talking debt-based mechanisms, which are microfinance. <laughs> and we started savings-based uh, introductions yeah. at that time. So, and then uh, when, <clears throat> with the, uh, and Yehuda Pass has there been all along. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we have, uh, when I was at ICA, we also all organized a business office in Singapore. Right, uh, so we have a regional office in Delhi, and Roberto Rodriguez at the time said, you know, the Eastern uh, members of ICA, which is Japan, Korea, China, you know, uh, and Southeast Asia, would like to have a business entity, a, a, a interactive, or oh, sorry, intercooperative trading mechanisms, or not. Mm -hmm. so we need have to have a good hub in Asia. So that's why we set up the business office in. In Singapore. Singapore. Mm -hmm. In Singapore. So, and my having to go between Delhi and Singapore allows also, say, Yehuda to come very often to Singapore because the NTUC being a trade union, you know, because we, were, we learned a lot about how trade unionism should also be cooperatively uh, organized uh, as, as, as a parallel structure. And so, mm -hmm. and, and how fair price and income and all the rest of them became big. Although, uh, of course, there's a lot of government, uh, uh, what is it, uh, policies that made it happen, right? And the mm -hmm. government policies being sometimes also quite strict <laughs> or quite stringent, so to speak. But anyway, so we learn how, co uh, how trade unions and co this work. And that's also a new idea to promote in other places, how trade unions should also be, you know, as part of SSE, for example, mm -hmm. we, are, we are an ecosystem that we needs mm -hmm. to all, all work together. Mm -hmm. And back to where I was with the trade union also, Simel, uh, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to let you know, why, why did we manage to get trade unions organized during the incubation period? Because I worked a lot with the civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. For instance, the, I, I worked a lot with the uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 Institute, of, uh, Institute of Law 
owned by the civil society. I work with the environmental group called WALHI. I work with the consumer group, you know. And so that's how credit unions also has to fit in within the SSE at that time. Mm -hmm. so, and I think when ILO now promotes the SSE, it clicks into me, in, in my mind, that in the past, that was what made the movement mm -hmm. also grow. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so th this is just a little flashback. But anyway, back to uh, the business office and the regional office. Uh, <clears throat> so, when Yehuda Pass was very actively involved there, then of course, you know, after Martin, there was Joe Fascio, <laughs> and and Joe Fascio also, uh, what is it, uh, uh, was uh, uh, helping uh, organize a corporate meeting. In the, at the ILO office, so I was there, and <laughs> and again uh, we we discussed a lot of uh, co uh, common issues in the region, how we should work together, and then um, <clears throat> uh, comes uh, and then sorry, and then comes uh, 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 Jürgen uh, Sedman, <laughs> where we discussed so much about the uh, uh, shift from one to seven to recommendation 193 right okay. anyway i'll stop there i hoping that the time is not uh, is still there <laughs> no no you we were you're doing great it's um i was wondering how has the uh cooperative movement changed uh, across the years in asia pacific from the time you got started to this day uh, in these 50 plus years well, it's a good question there, uh, <clears throat> uh, Simel. My view is, you know, because most of the Asian countries, both Commonwealth and non-Commonwealth, were all colonized except for Thailand, and I'm I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to put aside Japan, Korea, right? But look at uh, at India, Indonesia, Th uh, Nepal, Philippines. They're all colonized in the past. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, uh, the shift from old colonial uh, patterns to the new ones have not shifted much because why they gave so much strength to the bureaucracies in those countries. And that's why the government conti continues to be very much uh, directive. They, they are domineering. And, and if you look at the policies and uh, and legislation in the past, they're so much, they're, they're all uh, register based, you know, mm -hmm. because register mm -hmm. is the creator, mm -hmm. is the preserver, and the destroyer of the cooperative. <laughs> and that being the case, um, <clears throat> I can see the shift because we set up ministers' conferences in, at ICA. Mm -hmm. We try to see if through ministers' conferences and ILO being always part of the uh, of the advisory team for the ministers' conferences, whether we could change policies and legislation in some of the countries that we are engaged in. Now, that said, in some countries we have been able to do that gradually or even incrementally. Uh, take, for example, Vietnam. You know, it's it's still a very much of a socialist uh, base. Uh, country, but with the law there, they have been able to promote their uh, co op this better, so to speak, rather than the old collectives, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Indonesia, well, yes, there was a law in 1992 that was also very much promulgated uh, based on the uh, 127, uh, ILO 127. Uh, but again, it's still very lopsided <laughs> because mm -hmm. why? Uh, the definition they said cooperatives is an en is a corporate enterprise that's owned by people. So again, the very definition is out of context. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we have the uh, again uh, cooperative deform, uh, cooperative law number seventeen. Again, they said they have consulted ILO uh, based on uh, recommendation uh, one ninety three. But you know what? It's even worse. <laughs> Than, than cooperative uh, of number 20, 25. Because again, you know, cooperative is a product of the ecosystem, prevailing ecosystem in the country. And it's only a liberalistic, given the Indonesian system. And so the, the law, legislation, again, is very much lopsided and towards the private sector. Mm -hmm. and, and even the board is called commissary, you know, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like any, any private corporation. 
And so I and some, uh, well, one of my cadres have been able to enforce a group of people to try and uh, do a judicial review at the, at the uh, constitutional court. And we won that judicial review. So it was annulled. And now the court this is being reenacted, the old 25 is being reenacted, which is also a bad law. Mm. But now, mm. now, having said that, I'm coming back to your question what do you see in terms of change? There is a lot of uh, changes in terms of um, uh, uh, in terms of perhaps uh, people's enterprises, but less so in terms of regulatory professions. For okay. Because okay. you know you have ministers' conferences, and I am being very uh, critical. Also, you, ministers come, but ministers are only five years or ten years at the most uh, mm -hmm. there. And he may not be a cooperator. <laughs> he may be one from political parties. So they are not really engaged on understanding what God this is like. We mm. have to engage more parliamentarians, I think, in, mm. uh, in the future. Mm. Uh, so on the legislative side, I think there are lots of uh, there are lots of uh, things to do yet. But um, on the business side, I think things are moving very well in the sense that I think the young and the women are very much involved in making that change possible. And I believe so because why the old traditional forms of cultists are all uh, being led by old timers mm -hmm. and the mindset never changed, you know. Mm -hmm. And their, de their dependency syndrome on government uh, funding, government, uh, what you should, uh, uh, government subsidies continue to prevail. And so they, uh, they are basically, uh, there is a uh, uh, lame dog sitting waiting for, for, for subsidies to come. Uh, mm. Whereas uh, I think the younger generation has now moved well in terms of bringing uh, new insights in, into even the credit union movement. You know, in, in the credit union movement in Indonesia, we have more than 3 million members now. But unless, unless the young and the women are more and more involved, I think that will become a stalemate. Because why? Uh, <clears throat> uh, the longer you stay there, the, the more money you get, <laughs> and that's and that's uh, and that's an unfortunate uh, quote unquote uh, mindset among many. Yeah. So you are talking of young people and women engaging in the existing cooperative institutions, or is it also that young people and uh, women are establishing uh, new? generation of cooperatives, new ideas and of cooperatives in new sectors uh, where they may not have been in the past. Definitely new sectors, definitely so. The young, uh, actually, you know, uh, well, certainly most recently the cooperative flat platform has been one of the main uh, issues being discussed among the young. And we have one cooperative in central Java, which is a Kopkun, which call it, in Indonesia, for example that has done uh, a good job in, uh, in setting up uh, a startup uh, mechanism for cooperatives. And they have set up a workers cooperative among, guess what, among pedicab drivers, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you can see these are the young who, who generated that. And having said that, it's also a reconversion, so to speak, of the old cooperatives to new ones. I'm saying so because, say, uh, let me speak about Indonesia first. We have many students cooperatives in Indonesia in the past, mm -hmm. lots of them. Mm -hmm. But these students cooperatives are only engaged in their own little hub activities, right? So, with the help of NFCUA at that time from the Japan, Japanese cooperatives, I managed to set up another universe, one university corp as a as a model, and that mm -hmm. university corp managed to reform the old, what do you call it, uh, the old uh, students mm -hmm. into a multi-stakeholder concept and not only multi-stakeholder but also into a SSE concept because mm -hmm. why they brought in even hawkers as members because hawkers are working around in this universities. They have professors, you know, and they have the students and they, they have the employees and they have the community at large. And now it evolved outside the university into a community cooperative, mm -hmm. which has a consumer cooperative, which has the startup hub, hub now, which, 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 uh, which I think day before yesterday, they had a, web, uh, a webinar mm -hmm. on the startups at uh, mm -hmm. the IC, 
one of them, uh, Anis Ali, is, uh, is the one in Central Java. So again, it's the young ones who really uh, are so enterprising and trying to build uh, the non-conventional one or reform the con conventional ones. And uh, I have been uh, lucky to work with many young ones and also trying to what we call spinning off credit unions into other mm -hmm. types of cooperatives. So now uh, the credit unions with lost liquidity, which they don't have, they don't know what to do with mm -hmm. the liquidity. They are now uh, using that as a um, part investment into a spin off mechanism where we build up agriculture couples corps among farmers, for example. So they mm. put their funds there and the farmers' funds are there. And also, uh, what is it? Um, outside funding may come in, but it's all ownership based and not, you know, and not subsidized based. It's mm. all ownership based. And, and now uh, the uh, credit union has built what they call a grouping, a group mechanism, just like Mondragon, just like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Corp UK. So they don't have just credit unions but also uh, environmental friendly uh, cooperative, for example. Mm -hmm. And the Clean Command Group in West Kalimantan has set up uh, a, a natural uh, uh, habitat where they call it uh, Clean Command River, Clean Command uh, Forest, Clean Command Animal Habitat. And why? Because they were, uh, they were going against the uh, uh, oligarchs or sorry uh, against the conglomerates who try to set up a monoculture uh, mm. what is it called monoculture uh, uh, palm, oil, palm, oil, no, palm oil plantation mm. so they want to encroach on the land of people mm. but since the credit union has more than 150,000 members their land cannot be encroached mm. by, by mm. the multinationals yeah. so wow. uh, in fact in fact now they reform that land to become a mm. uh, eco ecological hub of the mm. corp. Where do they get the money from? Loans from the credit unions. So right. again, you will you will have to again reconvert thinking, <laughs> you mm. know, from from the old traditional ways of thinking into much more multi-form thinking that allows the community to benefit from not just money, <laughs> but also from mm. their environment and also from their other livelihoods. So. In fact, uh, these examples you're sharing, Robbie, are very much related to the uh, changes around us, technology, climate change, the yes. uh, models, economic models uh, that uh, have been pursued in the last uh, uh, 20, uh, 30 years, uh, demographic changes. And now, of course, we are in the middle of a pandemic, uh, which is related right. to some of these issues of primacy right. of pro profit over people and planet. If uh, you could uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on what is the role uh, of cooperatives in this uh, uh, transformation, in this changing uh, world uh, that we uh, live in. Uh, very central, very central, Sina. And I think uh, cooperative being humanizing agents, you know, I guess uh, uh, while the debate continues to be very active between health and wealth, mm -hmm. <laughs> we are in a, we are, we have the seventh principle and the seventh principle is of course, you know, yeah, uh, community, mm -hmm. concern for community mm -hmm. and um, knowing that, you know, there's so much uh, high informality still in the, in the region and there's so much uh, workers with low income agriculture. Cooperatives are the first, uh, or I would say credit unions in particular are the first to help them out. Mm -hmm. And what I mentioned to you in West Kalimantan, the credit union has done so much that they've made five vehicles, they, they bought five vehicles, put in all the PPEs in the vehicles and have a little bank in the vehicle itself, you know, mm -hmm. with a teller. Mobile. Bank. Goes, goes all the way to the villages to ensure that there will be no contamination from urban to rural. And that's just one example. You can talk about mm -hmm. Sewa, of course. You know, Sewa has done so much in terms of both the empathy, uh, the compassion vis-a-vis -vis the leadership, vis-a-vis -vis the vigilance of their cooperative. But many all over the world, cooperatives are doing that. And I can quote that example in Indonesia, which is 
which I thought is remarkable because it's not just only talking about being empathetical, but they also think of their institutional sustainability after the COVID is over. So mm -hmm. financial, uh, what is it? Uh, fin financial well-being is being now discussed. Mm -hmm. how, how do you have financial well-being if you don't have monies right now? So not only loan restructuring and lo loan reconditioning that is important, but also mindset of people that they have to start thinking how they can save with all the little things that they have now for the future because the second wave may be even worse than the first wave so mm -hmm. that is the thinking that has been go growing among the young <laughs> right mm -hmm. and so so i think uh, i would very much uh, uh, encourage the young and women to be so much more involved in the cooperative system mm -hmm. and for us the all the ones or two cents words, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> um, what uh, would your um, advice uh, would would be to um, co uh, the next generation of cooperators? Uh, well, again, uh, keep going. Uh, the young ones, you know, have to sort of be more active in understanding cooperatives, not from its uh, not from its only practical point of view, but from also from its philosophical point of view, from its ideological point of view, because that's the only way you will sustain your passion in a cooperative. Mm -hmm. If you get involved in a cooperative just because you're a manager, you get into manageralism, and you, you don't get into a passion to really work for others, mm -hmm. and only work for your own well-being, right? And so again, you know, for the young, I would like to say that in the future, the lack of access to food and nutrition, for example, has to be taken care of. And, you know, and the limitation to a productive work now, they, they have to do more to make work more productive, I think. And, uh, <clears throat> and the high risk of climate change, <laughs> the high risk of climate change, and uh, because that also impact on food availability in the future. Okay. And so that, I think, would have to be taken into careful account by... Uh, by um, by the younger generation and and low education background because you know we have so much uh, people in Asia <laughs> and, mm. and many of them are not uh, well educated mm. so again the low, the low education background the farmers financial literacy training for them that has to be given to mm. all these uh, people which are really still uh, lowly educated because they can't afford school but they can mm. afford financial literacy which is, I think, one way of learning how to build their future life, right? And again, uh, uh, the limited access to uh, resource and market in everywhere. I just wrote an article which I will share with you, Simel, on the aqu mm -hmm. aquaculture last week. And it was in the ICBAP uh, newsletter. I don't know if you've read that. But again, mm -hmm. I, I will, uh, that is something that, that has to be taken into account because we have so much, uh, what you call it, richness. Uh, re, uh, and uh, aquaculture resources, but it's not well managed. If it's state managed, usually it will not work. So you will have to start building it from the ground up. And again, access to finance will be very important for that. And access to finance, uh, to markets will be important for that. So the aquaculture producers has to understand what it means to have a financial activity, what it means to access markets, and that's the reason why, again, cooperatives is the only vehicle to do that, and without which, they will be continuously oppressed by the trader bosses and the, uh, and the money lenders. Right. You have uh, mentioned a number of times uh, the continuum, uh, so to speak, between cooperatives and the wider social and solidarity economy institutions. Could you elaborate on that uh, alliance building, on that uh, commonalities, common grounds to be oh, yes. built upon? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Uh, I can even quote one example. One cooperative in Jakarta is called Kosakti. Mm -hmm. So Kosakti is a service provider. <laughs> it's a cooperative, not necessarily uh, engendering any particular uh, sector of finance or agriculture, but they, uh, but they generate uh, new businesses and enterprises among, among uh, their members. And their members are composed of civil society organizations that came in, uh, some farmers, you know, some uh, traders, uh, low, 
of course, low-key traders, not not high-end traders. Mm -hmm. uh, and these people are being uh, are being encouraged to try and experiment their enterprises, uh, which has a social meaning mm -hmm. or social purpose. And some of them manage, you know, they they set up a coffee hub. They mm -hmm. set among the filmmakers, they set up mm -hmm. documentaries, and one of the filmmakers uh, has already done a documentary, which I hope you will someday be able to see it, with the women's group, with the women's activists, and how women activists are actually, uh, uh, what is it, uh, generating income, gener uh, income generating activities for their members. And so this co-op is, is a service provider, it's a co-op, that is not just sitting there and doing one sector, but understanding various, various uh, means of uh, business with social purposes, which is the SSE, you know, but also combining uh, people with their uh, intellectual mindset from the civil society organizations, from trade unions, from women's groups, you know. And so I think this is, this is uh, one idea that, uh, that I saw can be promoted. And I could write a case study on that and, uh, on SSE. Which uh, again, you know, cooperatives is not uh, it's not an island on itself. <laughs> it has to work together with other sectors in order to be able to promote uh, the uh, what is it uh, the well-being of the community. Thank you very much, Robbie, for sharing your thoughts, experiences with us. It has been a pleasure, and uh, we look forward to staying in touch. Thank, Thank you very much. Let's see, well, hope to see you again soon. Yeah. Bye now.